So I'm Peter Van Valkenburg, and I'm trying to get my slides working. We're good? <laughs> I'm the director of research at Coin Center, where we um, educate lawmakers in Washington, D.C. about cryptocurrencies as a technology uh, and defend your rights to build and use them. I'm also a board member of the Zcash Foundation, uh, where we've been building privacy tools for the public good. And I am an advisor to Starkware, where we try to make things scale. So this talk is about cypherpunk ideals, because those are the reasons why we're here. Um, cypherpunk ideals have a history, goes back at least to the 80s. Um, and they are really, truly the basis for Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the larger space that we call crypto today. Still no slides? Anyway, a good place to start if we're going to talk about cypherpunk ideals is John Perry Barlow. And I have a picture. Maybe it'll come up. It'll come up in a second. Anyway, John Perry Barlow uh, was a songwriter for the Grateful Dead. Um, he was also a cattle rancher, and he was a founding member of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. How many people know the Electronic Frontier Foundation? Show of hands. It's not bad. I mean... This organization has existed for a long time now, um, and they are the premier digital civil liberties defenders, if you will, especially in the United States, uh, where they've pioneered a lot of constitutional challenges to make sure that some things like software can be published freely and without restriction or licensing by the government. Um, but John Perry Barlow, um, he's a hero uh, for cypherpunks, but also for a lot of other people. And unfortunately, he passed away in uh, 2018. But over 25 years ago, in 1996, Barlow wrote a piece that is referred to as the Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace. And I want to just read the beginning and end of that. Oh, good. There's John. He wrote in 1996, Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You're not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. And he concluded, we will create a civilization of the mind in cyberspace. May it be more humane and fair than the world your governments have made before. This is pretty heady stuff, pretty grand. You should read the whole thing. Um, and if you work in this space, you should also read Eric Hughes's Cypherpunk Manifesto, published in 1993, and Timothy May's Crypto Anarchist Manifesto, remarkably published in 1988. These early visionaries, they saw the future of the online world. They saw how global information systems could be used and abused by totalitarian states for surveillance and control, and they urged the adoption of technologies of privacy, and resistance and independence. As May said in 1988, the technology for this revolution, and it surely will be a both social and economic revolution, has existed in theory for the past decade. I guess 1978. The methods are based upon public key encryption, zero-knowledge interactive proof systems, and various software protocols for interaction, authentication, and verification. So, Tim May maintained the cypherpunk mailing list. Are you familiar with the mailing list? No one? Interesting. The cypherpunk mailing list was an email list. And uh, in October of 2008, 20 years after May's uh, manifesto, Satoshi Nakamoto published the Bitcoin white paper to that mailing list. That was the first place that it popped up. I've been working on a new electronic cash system that's fully peer-to-peer -peer with no trusted party. And of course, that work would go on to form the basis for Bitcoin, the peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, what I would say is the first example of a truly independent, decentralized organization that exists in cyberspace. But a lot of other things have happened in the 25 years since John Perry Barlow's Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace. We've seen the emergence of the corporate industrial internet. And a lot of people, even within the internet advocacy community that I'm in, 
sometimes re- the, they, they view John Perry's um, declaration as optimistic or even naive. So Google, Facebook, Amazon, the rise of these powerful corporations mean that we also have the rise of government surveillance that those corporations uh, facilitate and even promote quite often. Things like the NSA's PRISM program, which collected masses of information from these corporations, all without a warrant or any kind of legal process. And so, when you have a system that relies on corporate efficiency to gather and accumulate all this information, and you have government force matched with that corporate system, you're not living in a very free world. The internet that we live in today is really a marriage between corporate efficiency and government force. Arguably, it's a quasi-fascist state. And I'd like to say that the world of crypto is a whole lot better. But unfortunately, even in the world of cryptocurrencies, we always see again and again the stubborn return of trusted entities who often commit fraud, are opaque about their activities, and harm the public. So maybe our civilization of the mind, as John Perry Barlow put it, is at the moment no more humane uh, or fair than the old world's weary giants of flesh and steel. That said, Bitcoin and a handful of other networks, at least, have a plausible independence in fact. So transactions are broadcast, verified, Blocks are agreed upon by the entire network, and all of this happens without any um, government order, without any corporate contract, and without any lawyers involved, which I think sometimes has its benefits. So thus far, no state actor as well uh, has been able to disrupt this process, despite the fact that several states may want to disrupt this process. So maybe it's enough that this independence so far is true in fact, real and testable, even if it's limited to certain corners of the internet that are not mass surveilled and mass controlled. I do think though, we need a justification for this independence. It can't just be better internet casinos. It can't just be because blockchain's cool. I think we need to go back to and stick to the roots of the cypherpunk ethos as we build these systems. And I think that's important because we need to know when we're making bogus claims about decentralization and independence that don't deserve to be taken seriously by folks in government. So what justifies the independence of cyberspace? Where are the limits? These are three that I see over the last decade that I've worked in this space. Justifications based on the anonymity of the participants, which I would say are generally bad justifications. Justifications based on the activities of the participants and the network, and justifications based on the activities, uh, that last one shouldn't be activities, uh, the results of the activities of the participants. So what does the activity actually accomplish in the world? So anonymity. I too often hear people say that Satoshi was able to create the Bitcoin network because by remaining anonymous, he wouldn't get caught breaking the law. This is simply wrong. Nothing that we know Satoshi did, from publishing the white paper, to developing the first version of the Bitcoin client, to mining and uh, broadcasting the first Bitcoin block, none of those activities were illegal in the US or in any other liberal jurisdiction. So it was not his anonymity that justified the creation of Bitcoin and the independence of Bitcoin as a network. It was the fact that he didn't break the law but still created something remarkable. And I want to say this really very clearly, anonymity is not a justification for independence. If doing X, activity X, is a regulated activity in the real world, then when you do it online, it will also be a regulated activity, even if you don't know the names of the people you're doing it with, or they don't know your names. It might make it harder for people in government who have to enforce those regulations to find you, but do you really want to be a fugitive? I don't think crypto anarchy or the cypherpunk ethos is about being a fugitive. I think it's about standing up for things like speech and privacy when it's important to do so. The cypherpunk ideal, as I see it, has never been about complete anarchy because the government can't identify anybody doing anything. The cypherpunk ideal is that some activities 
which don't involve a trusted relationship, taking somebody's money, making promises to them, some activities should be anarchic and outside of the realm of government control, specifically speech. So this is Hong Kong during the recent protest movements. I would say where illiberal regimes attempt to censor speech and obtain total control over their populations, then it is justified for the population to protest and disobey those laws, and anonymity tools can and should be used to support that disobedience. They could also have a soundtrack too, it's heartwarming. Similarly, if you seek anonymity merely to protect your own intimate activities, activities that don't implicate the well-being of others or trusted relationships or society at large, just your own private activities, these tools should be available. If I want to take my salary by using Ethereum, I should be able to make those transactions privately with my employer. I have to report them for taxes, I have to do other things, but I shouldn't be forced to have those transactions public on chain if there's a good tool I can use to have reasonable privacy over my income. I think that's true. But that's also what we need to fight for in the wake of OFAC's sanctioning of the Tornado Cash tool for privacy online. So this brings me to my second justification for independence, which is activity. So as I said, the cypherpunk ideal isn't about um, being free to do whatever you want. It's about protecting your freedom to do certain activities, primarily speech. So as Eric Hughes wrote, cypherpunks write code. We know that someone has to write software to defend privacy, and since we can't get privacy unless we all do, we're going to write it. We publish our code so our fellow cypherpunks may practice and play with it. Our code is free for all to use worldwide. We don't much care if you don't approve of the software we write. We know that software can't be destroyed and that a widely dispersed system can't be shut down. That's again, that's 1988. And Satoshi, was not remarkable for hiding his identity, as I said. He's remarkable for giving birth to a powerful network while doing nothing beyond publishing information, by speaking. His activity, speaking, was something that's fully legal, unpermissioned, and indeed protected by the US Constitution and the UN Declaration of Human Rights. So the cypherpunk ideal is about free speech, and as Hughes wrote, it's also about open source code. It's also about publishing tools freely for everyone to use to protect their own speech rights or privacy rights. So it's not about corporations being able to trade secrets with each other without regulation. It's about publishing code to the world as a public good. That's an important part of the cypherpunk ethos, I'd say. Maybe an underappreciated one. This is why open source is and must be central to crypto projects if they want to have a legitimate claim to building tools that are there for the public good. And it's why I have to congratulate the Starkware team for committing to open sourcing the, the uh, technologies behind StarkNet. So if all you're doing is publishing code to the internet or relaying and validating signed transaction messages, I would argue you are engaged in speech. In the US at least, you are protected by the First Amendment, and organizations like Coin Center will fight for your right to continue speaking. As an example, again, our current lawsuit against the US Department of Treasury in the case of the OFAC sanctions against Tornado Cash users. Now, when you start doing more than just publishing protocol code or blocks on the blockchain, it gets murkier. If you're asking people to trust you rather than merely being an indifferent publisher of information, you've begun to depart from the cypherpunk ideal and regulation of your activities may be justified and may be inevitable. So for example, if you offer any custodial service, you accept and transmit assets on behalf of someone else, at that point, you're going to be classified as a money transmitter in many jurisdictions around the world. You'll have to know all of your customers and have risk-calibrated anti-money laundering programs. If you take money and promise people a return on their investment, you may be issuing a security. You need to register and do disclosures under investor protection laws in the US and abroad. Now, how explicit or implicit that promise to investors can be without triggering a disclosure requirement? Well, that is the crux of the security law question with regard to US laws especially, but that's a topic for a whole different talk. So finally, 
Let's talk about cypherpunk results. Here, the lesson is to focus on core cypherpunk principles of fairness, verifiability, freedom, privacy for everyone. So building technologies that get those results will often trigger enhanced scrutiny from governments, because privacy and censorship-resistant tools will inevitably be misused by criminals. But I would argue the juice is worth the squeeze, because you'll find allies even in government, even in the legislature, in the government agencies that regulate activities, you'll find allies who also earnestly believe in freedom and privacy. You'll find very few allies who are going to find you interesting if all of you built is a centralized casino online. And it's my cont contention that the crypto community does its best work when it conservatively revives the human capabilities that were eroded by the industrial information age. Technologies like cash, as opposed to a bank wire. So I just want to give one example. Um, now that we have such top-down global systems, are liberties truly at risk? A woman in Texas will struggle to obtain enough physical cash to pay for an abortion. It's difficult to get that much cash out of ATMs. Her credit cards and other online payment tools may be blocked. She'll be tracked if she travels to her appointment via an Uber or Lyft. And she may even be reported for merely researching the topic of family planning using a Google search. Now, irrespective of your feelings or opinions or perspective on abortion, you must acknowledge that this is still a step backwards. I would say that the laws should clearly state what is prohibited and then respect the dignity of the citizen by allowing them the choice to break them or to be obedient. When the law instead colludes with the physical built environment, so the transportation infrastructure like Uber and Lyft, the payment technologies like Venmo and Visa, the bookstores or the online search, search tools, at that point, the citizen has no choice of obedience. She's being herded into the only socially acceptable choice. And her dignity and agency and self-determination are erased. So the surveilled and controlled citizen is not a citizen. He's a tool of the elites in power. As Hannah Arendt wrote, respect for human dignity implies the recognition of my fellow men and our fellow nations as subjects, as builders of worlds or co-builders of a common world. Men and women with no choice but obedience are not co-builders. They are tools for building someone else's world. So this, more than anything else, is what justifies the independence of cyberspace. The results sought by Barlow, Hughes, May, Satoshi, Vitalik, and others, the result is individual empowerment and choice. I should be able to hold my own money, I should be able to pay others without being forced to rely on a corporation or government. And it should go beyond money to any shared computing or dealing, whether it's about my identity, my labor, my art. I should be in control. And blockchains don't do many things well. They're expensive, they're inefficient. But the one thing they do do well is they can return power and agency to individuals who have otherwise become wholly dependent on corporations for their dealings online. And that's a cyberspace worth fighting for. Thank you.